welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I'm also the principal attorney of Imagine Power LLC. Today we're going to discuss how the law in Hawaii and across the country can be used to address issues related to climate change. Now, we know that in order to stop catastrophic climate change, we, as global citizens, must reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also learn how to adapt to changing weather and rising seas. This means that we must make adjustments to business as usual. But how, if at all, can individuals and states take action absent a unified policy to take action. To discuss what legal tools are available to take action on climate change in Hawaii, we are joined in the studio today by Doug Kodiga. Doug is a member of the firm Schlack Ito, concentrating his practice in the areas of energy and environmental law, with an emphasis on regulatory and administrative proceedings and dispute resolution. Mr. Kodiga founded Hawaii's first climate and sustainability law practice group in 2007 and frequently publishes and lectures on clean energy, climate change, and environmental law and policy. Doug has written an important article for the Hawaii Law Journal, I believe we have a picture of the cover, called Climate Litigation in Hawaii. And so we are very pleased that he is here with us to discuss it. So. Welcome to you, Doug. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. So first, Doug, maybe you could just go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background and why you decided to become an energy attorney. Uh, well, briefly, it's a, probably a combination of uh, academic and professional interests. Um, uh, as, a, as an undergraduate and law student, I always focused on energy and environmental law issues. Mm. And <clears throat> I've been fortunate to build a law practice here in Hawaii uh, driven by client issues and concerns in those areas. So. Well, that is fantastic. So I um, read this article. It is super important and interesting. Um, and you know, you, you cover a lot of topics, and I think one of the things that is most <coughs> most important is, you know, I think, there's a lot going on with climate change. We've got a lot happening at the national, international level. We've had historic agreements. We have our own president seeking to sort of the administration, as we understand, seeking to pull out of these agreements. So I think people think, gosh, what can we do? Is there something that we can do? Is there something in the law that will allow us to counter these forces? Is there a way that we can um, fight climate change? And your article really talks a lot about the different ways the law could be used to do that in Hawaii and across the country. Um, but first, it really kind of talks a little bit about some of the challenges that um, Hawaii faces um, as we look forward to climate change. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about what some of those challenges are. Well, certainly, and I think what you're pointing to is very important and relevant, which is the fact that the states uh, t have traditionally played an important role in addressing these kinds of issues. Mm. And it may be the case that we're entering a phase now, or many, many would suggest we're entering a phase now where states will continue to play an important role. And I think the purpose of my article, one of the reasons I wrote the article was to draw attention to some of the approaches that may be available to address climate change issues, regardless of what's happening at the federal or national level. These are, these are uh, tools that may be available to us now at this time. And um, what is it driven by? I mean, it's driven by a confluence of different factors. But I mean, the, I think what you're getting at are the actual impacts of climate yes, change. Yes, yes, yes. And of yes. course, these are pretty well documented now by a broad range of scientists. Uh, certainly the fact that climate change, there's an anthropogenic or uh, human-caused dimension to climate change um, from greenhouse gas emissions, but then also there's an emerging consensus around the impacts. In particular, we can look at sea level rise, uh, changes in precipitation patterns, mm -hmm. uh, ocean acidification, and so forth. These are, these are impacts that are fairly well documented now. And is it, um, is it fair to say that um, Hawaii faces some of these threats in a way that may be different on the mainland? Well, there's no doubt as an island state that we will, will feel impacts uh, somewhat unique to our, our geographic location. Uh, I think that's probably true for, for many places. It can be said of many places as well. I think the key point here is that as lawyers, as people focused in the law, we may look to others for proof in the science, or for, for science and the scientific uh, experts in particular to provide support. And to the extent that support exists, then we can proceed with these legal claims. 
Okay, very interesting. So you start out your article talking about two sort of main areas um, of climate and the substantive legal, um, substantive legal basis for climate litigation. And you talk about both mitigation and adaptation. So could you explain for folks what that means? Sure, that's the basic distinction that is drawn in addressing climate change issues between reducing the greenhouse gases that cause climate change and then on the other hand adapting to climate change impacts themselves. So this is a very broad kind of distinction between two basic approaches. So could you talk about where some of the legal basis for claims in these two areas lie? Well, I mean, if, we're, if, if by legal basis you're thinking about statute, statutory law, um, we have major uh, pieces of uh, state legislation addressing both mitigation and adaptation. And um, for example, if we look back at, uh, if we look over to the mitigation side, we see that Hawaii was among the very first states in the country to pass a Kyoto Protocol-like uh, cap on greenhouse gas emissions, known as Act 234 in mm. 2007. Oh, interesting. So could you actually, could you go ahead and walk us through a bit more about um, Hawaii's state climate change law? Laws? Sure, sure. So I think, the, I think the, yeah, there, there's a range of different statements and laws, and, it, and it's reflected in the administrative rules as well, as you would expect. But basically, you know, the legislature concluded, again, back in 2007, that the science, again, supported these conclusions that there were climate change impacts that could adversely impact Hawaii's natural environment, and Hawaii's economy, in particular tourism. So as a result, the state legislature took, I think, fairly bold action in establishing a cap on greenhouse gas emissions. What does this mean? This means that as a state, we have to limit our total greenhouse gas emissions to a level that is at or below what they were in 1990. That is interesting. So is, is there, are there also um, actions on the adaptation side, or is there state law on the adaptation Indeed, side? Indeed, well? there isn't, there isn't, well, there's a range of different uh, laws or acts that we can uh, look to on the adaptation side. Um, uh, for example, the uh, state has directed that a report be prepared on sea level rise. Sea level rise, I think many people are aware of this uh, phenomenon in Hawaii and around the world. And the legislature actually recognized this as well, based on the science, as being an incredibly uh, important issue to address and passed a law mandating, at, at the minimum, the preparation of a, a, of a high-level report, high-level study on the impacts of sea level rise, many other uh, initiatives as well. Now, in your article, you talk about uh, ways that citizens and others may be able to use this, um, uh, this Hawaii state laws to bring suits. Could you tell us a little bit about that? And uh, perhaps sure. you could talk about one of the cases that you mentioned in your article. Sure, sure. So this is, uh, you know, this is a rather a straightforward application of, the, of a, of a well-established federal and state legal regime, uh, which is based off the Federal Clean Air Act. And of course, we have our Hawaii state version of the same law. And this essentially, you know, we talked about mitigation and capping these greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the statute allows for citizens to bring suits if there is a violation of the emissions limit. So basically what that means is that if you have a large emitter of greenhouse gas pollutants, uh, possibly a power plant or some other source, and you are able to prove that it's, um, it's, it, the emissions have exceeded the limit, then we don't have to wait for a government agency to take an enforcement action. A citizen can bring what's called a citizen suit. That is really interesting. Has there been a citizen suit so far? Or? Well, certainly not, not that I'm aware of on this issue. And in fact, that's why I'm saying it's rather straightforward. This, this federal statute has been in place for decades. And of course, uh, it's had the same citizen suit provision. So this is basically, to my mind, it's an example of how climate change really is going to be addressed the same way we've grappled with other environmental issues, essentially. Interesting. With some, with some notable exceptions. Well, go ahead and uh, explain a little bit more about what you mean about that. Okay, well, uh, the notable exception in this case, most likely on the, on the mitigation side, would be what's called atmospheric trust litigation. Yeah, no, you and, talk about that a lot in your, in your article. Right. I think it would be super helpful if you could just first go ahead and say, what is atmospheric trust 
What is atmospheric trust litigation? What is atmospheric trust? Yes, it's not not immediately uh, easy to to grasp and understand. <laughs> and it's an example. It shows you how the law can be adaptive itself to address. In other words, novel legal theories will arise in response to novel environmental issues. The Clean Air Act uh, citizen supervision has been established for decades. On the other hand, uh, atmospheric trust litigation is not yet well established at all. To briefly summarize what it is attempting to do, uh, is it, it's attempting to uh, protect the atmosphere the same way that the courts protect other public trust resources. And the simplest example in Hawaii would be the shoreline area, the beach, as a public trust resource, or maybe fresh water resources as well. Okay, so if you could, I understand that um, there are some suits going forward in this in this area. How long has this been happening? I know you're saying it's sort of relatively novel, and and what are some of the? Why don't you dig into a, a, one of the the cases that's happening and help us understand? Sure, sure. So again, the notion is that like like the ocean, like the shoreline area, or like freshwater resources, they are held in trust by the government for all citizens. So we're trying to apply that. That notion would be applied as well to the air, to, the to air, our atmosphere. To the air, to the atmosphere. And the c claim would be that the government has failed to take sufficiently protective measures of the atmosphere. So that has given rise to litigation, to, to lawsuits filed in federal district courts across the United States. And thus far, most of them have met with little or no success, with one exception, the Juliana case out of Oregon which is actually moving forward. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this Juliana case? Maybe you could tell us a little bit, maybe a little bit of what the facts are and you know how it came forward and then what its significance is. So it's, I believe it's considered the leading, uh, one of the leading atmospheric trust litigation cases in the United States. And again, this is a very novel theory. It's been uh, not well received by most mm. courts. Most courts have concluded the Clean Air Act itself displaces these claims or, or had other issues with having it go forward. Um, but in the Juliana case, um, it's brought, first, interestingly, it's brought by a, a group of youth plaintiffs. So these are younger people, uh, I believe uh, high school, elementary school, maybe college age youth who are claiming that the government's not taking sufficiently protective measures to protect the atmosphere as a public trust resource. Wow, that is amazing that young people came forward to do that. So go ahead, tell us tell us a little bit how this has been sort of snaking forward. So it's a, it, the, the plaintiff is a nonprofit organization, Our Children's Trust, which represents the youth or is comprised of the youth plaintiffs. Uh, they filed a, a direct action in the U.S. Federal District Court in Oregon. Um, that action uh, was opposed by the government, uh, rel relevant government agencies and other um, intervener parties. The opposition essentially argued that the claim uh, that the atmosphere is a public trust resource has already essentially been already been addressed by the Federal Clean Air Act, and so therefore it's All been. Right. Mm -hmm. We are going to take a break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to learn more about this Giuliana, uh, Giuliana case, where the kids have come forward to say that we need to do more to protect our atmosphere. We will be right back with more um, from Power Up Hawaii. Hello and welcome back to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii walk, comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. We're here with Doug Kodaga, an attorney with Schlack Ito uh, here in Honolulu, and we're talking about an interesting article that he wrote on ch climate change litigation in Hawaii for the Hawaii Bar Journal. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you once again, Doug. And we were just talking about atmospheric trust litigation, and uh, which is sounding like an interesting, evolving area of law, and a particular case of 
Giuliana case where it sounds like some youth, some children, some elementary school kids got together with the nonprofit to come forward and say, state of, sorry, which state were we talking about? State of Oregon, mm -hmm. you are not doing enough to protect our atmosphere. And so um, Doug was just talking about the state response and where the case is now. So please, Doug, go ahead and continue. Sure, sure. So, yeah, so this youth group has advanced the novel legal theory that the atmosphere is a public trust resource. And maybe I should say just a quick word about the public trust. No, please. That idea is the it comes from Roman law and was actually validated as well by the English common law system and carried its way into the U.S. constitutional and <laughs> particularly the Hawaii state constitution which has very strong uh, public trust related provisions. Um, the idea is that certain resources are to be held in trust by the, gov by the public. They're, they are held in trust by the public and therefore should be protected accordingly. So this novel theory is that not only are uh, freshwater resources and ocean coastal resources and similar resources held in trust for the public, but the atmosphere is as well. Uh, they filed their lawsuit claiming that essentially the government had breached, as a trustee, had breached its obligations. Uh, this was opposed in, uh, by filings by other, the state government agencies and other interested parties on the grounds that it's not a viable legal theory. In particular, it was claimed that the, the Federal Clean Air Act displaced this whole atmospheric trust so approach. I guess, how, how would that work, meaning that the federal government has already led, you know, there's already authority on the air, and that, yes, you know, the yes. sort of side claim about trust of the atmosphere is subsumed, or uh, yeah, how it, does that go? Uh, well, it's essentially, um, uh, it's almost a type of a preemption argument that the, the federal, the, the government, uh, in a very basic sense, the government has spoken by adopting legislation that addresses the same issue. In other words, uh, since Mass v. EPA, the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision, which uh, regulates greenhouse gas emissions or authorizes the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions under right. the Federal Clean Air Act. And that is done, of course, through the Federal Clean Air Act. And so the basic argument, as I understand it, is we've occupied the field. There's no um, need for a novel theory to proceed on. Yet this case is, 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 uh, is all is not lost well, for these kids. So uh, what's one, going on? One step at a time. Um, <laughs> the most uh, well, there's been several, a few recent rulings I'm aware of, which one is which that uh, I believe the uh, Oregon Federal District Court rejected the motion to dismiss brought by the defendant parties. In other words, they said this is not a viable claim, and I believe the court dismissed that and, 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 and rejected, they essentially rejected their claim that it was not viable. So that allows it to go forward. Um, <clears throat> more recently, I believe within the last week or so, the same defendants said, why don't oh, wow. we have the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal? look at this before we go to trial. They are headed for trial. And um, I, I believe that um, the, the, same, uh, the federal district court in Oregon again rejected that uh, argument that this should be taken up by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals immediately, in other words, before trial. Before so trial. they're headed for trial. That, I believe, is, so. that is incredible. So yeah. the trial means then that these, these issues are going to be these issues are going to come out and be discussed on the merits, is that correct? It seems to be the case, yes. Um, so. Do we have any idea of what the timetable is on that? I believe they're set for tr setting up for trial later this year. Uh -huh. Wow, well that so. will be an amazing it, and interesting one to mm -hmm. watch. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, well, that that is really interesting. So. Wow, so we've got atmospheric trust, or the idea that um, uh, the, the air is in, it, or the atmosphere is, um, should be protected um, um, as in the public trust, which is interesting. What are some other ways that, um, in, this, in particular in the state of Hawaii, where these issues can be addressed? You talked about um, PUC proceedings. You talked about our renewable portfolio standards. What are some of the, um, the ways in the state that, uh, that these, these issues may be able to be addressed. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, the atmospheric trust litigation, like I said, is novel. And so we don't know uh, exactly where that is going to go. Um, we'll, we're all watching it with interest, of course. Wow, that's just um, fascinating. On the mitigation side, we talked earlier about mitigation and adaptation. Yes. Continuing sort of on the mitigation side, um, one of the main uh, sources of greenhouse gas emissions is uh, electric, electric power production particularly from uh, power plants in Hawaii that use uh, fossil fuels, so whether it be coal or, or fuel oil. And so, uh, as, I'm, as I know you are well aware, um, we have a number of landmark proceedings, or key proceedings, I should say, some of them turn out to be landmark proceedings, uh, mm -hmm. addressing uh, 
clean energy law and policy. So these are, these are administrative law proceedings, sometimes quasi-judicial proceedings, sometimes investigatory proceedings, which are taking up the issue of how do we transition from fossil fuel use to non-fossil or renewable resources. Is there, I mean, and, and this is, I mean, this is just completely off the, off, uh, the top of my head. If for some reason we as, and I'll say we as a community, or we as the folks in the energy community fail to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, then I believe would there then be a place for a citizen suit or other type of suit to be brought? And who would it be brought against, if so? Uh, I, well, I mean, the citizen I mean, suit provision, yeah, the citizen suit question. provision, just to clarify, the citizen suit provision um, is, uh, is it li it's, it's in the Clean Air Act, right? So it's a part of the oh, Federal okay. Clean Air Act. So it's tied to the enforcement. Actually, there's, there's a several things, you, a few things that can happen with Please, that. Please, break it down. You can break enforce it down for the, the, <laughs> you can enforce the uh, emissions limit if there is a Title V Clean Air permit that a facility holds and there is an emissions limit uh, tied to greenhouse gas emissions and that emissions limit is not met, as I mentioned earlier then citizens can bring a suit to enforce. Also, if there's other permit conditions that aren't met, citizen suit may be possible as well. And then finally, if the Department of Health fails to take action. I understand. As well. But that's, that's all uh, under the, on, at the, on, the P, on the Public Utilities Commission side, I think we're really talking about perhaps appellate. Is that what you were thinking, maybe, if there's? Ah, yeah, no, please, please tell me, I, you know, if, there, if there's, you know, is there, I guess if for some reason we fail to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the state level, is there a remedy or is there an action that could be brought? I see, I see. I was uh, clumsily trying to get to the question. Yeah, yeah, so the, as you are well aware, uh, the, uh, the Public Utilities Commission proceedings do result in binding decisions and orders. Uh, they're designed, of course, to regulate uh, a publicly regulated utilities. And so those decisions and orders are not, I would say, are not directly focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I will say, however, that uh, I have noticed uh, greenhouse, uh, references to greenhouse gases uh, increasing in frequency. For example, just the commission recently issued an order um, concerning a proposal by the utility to purchase a fossil fuel power plant. And one of the issues in the proceeding was how much what's the purchase price and the commission noted that the uh, consultants analysis of that failed in its view I believe failed to properly consider greenhouse gas emissions in other words that plant may itself require upgrades to comply with Act 234 now more more dramatically or perhaps more to the point um, in another uh, PUC docket involving the extension of a power purchase agreement for a coal-fired power plant I believe the commission did conclude in that docket that the extension of the PPA was not warranted for a whole range of reasons and one of them actually was related again to greenhouse gas emissions. So. All right, very interesting. Yeah. Um, so we, since we have a few more minutes, let's talk an, about another um, section of your article that I thought was um, really important and that was sea level rise and what, mm. that, what type of liability that that may um, create for uh, I, I don't, not only developers, but developers, other folks, um, you know, who are making plans for land development. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so this is another uh, emerging area of the law, and it's actually a little bit like atmospheric trust litigation in some ways because it's, there are some novel theories that are being advanced and developed, and so we don't, we can't say with certainty sitting here now that these are, you know, concrete, actionable theories, and I tried to make that point in my article that they're they're on the horizons or, you know, of, of potential advances, and we should be aware of them. But one of them is uh, definitely relates to coastal development in Hawaii. And the basic notion is that uh, there may be a tort claim against local government or state government agencies that fail to properly, that, fail, that, that approve coastal development without properly considering sea level rise. So this could create liability for the state. Indeed, potentially. Again, these are these are more novel theories. Of course, uh, the state has its own uh, well-established protections against such potential such types of claims. So, it remains to be seen. Not only the state as well. I think developers also should be aware when they're developing coastal properties that they have a duty to uh, uh, take care of the. They, they're they're sure that they understand the impacts of sea level rise as, as it may affect their project. 
that would mean getting in early and retaining uh, consultants and others to advise them on what are the potential risks of developing in a, in a coastal area that could be impacted by sea level rise. We only have just a minute left, but do, this seems um, like it could be extremely important. There's so much development happening on the coastlines here. Do you think that that's happened? Do you think that there is awareness amongst the, the, the development community that this is an issue that they need to be addressed? Yes, I do. Uh, we see some encouraging signs. We see uh, web-based tools that allow uh, developers to understand the impacts of sea level rise. We see the University of Hawaii mm. uh, pretty uh, heavily engaged in trying to publicize and promote public awareness about these issues. We see a series of publications addressing these issues. So I think that um, I think this issue is coming to the fore. All right. Well, Doug, thank you so much for um, for your work and for coming to talk with us um, about this. What I think is an extremely important article. Um, and thank you so much for joining us again for Power Up Hawaii. We will see you next week. Aloha and mahalo.